A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 26th of December 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. So without much delay, now let us get into the first news article discussion. Now this column editorial article talks about the union government's decision to discontinue the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana PMGKAY, the government decided to merge the benefits provided under PMGKAY into the National Food Security Act and continue providing the benefits till 2023. So basically even though the PMGKAY is now discontinued, the people who received benefits under the scheme will continue receiving it till December 2023 as part of NFSA. So this is the crux of the article given here. The editorial article talks about the beneficial role played by PMGKAY and how the recent move of government will be beneficial to the states. Let us see the major points from this editorial article in this discussion. Firstly, let us revise about this PMGKAY. See, PMGKAY was provided as a part of Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan package. Under the scheme, nearly 80 crore people who were covered under the NFSA or provided with 5 kilogram of free rice or wheat. This is provided in addition to the benefits provided under NFSA. We know that under NFSA, every beneficiary will be provided with 5 kilograms of food grains per month at a subsidized rate of rupees 3 per kilogram for rice, rupees 2 per kilogram for wheat and rupees 1 per kilogram for coarse grains. So, the PMGKAY provides the 5 kilogram of free rice or wheat over and above the benefits provided by NFSA. So, this is about PMGKAY. Now, let us see the important role played by the PMGKAY as mentioned in the editorial. First and the most important role played by PMGKAY is that by providing food security, the government helped the people address the distress that they faced due to COVID and COVID-induced lockdown. Secondly, the scheme not only acted as a food security but also acted as income transfer for the poor. For example, let us assume a person spends 200 rupees per month buying food grains. If the person is provided 5 kg of rice or wheat for free per month, he will save the 200 rupees, right? So this is how the PMGKAY acts both as a food security scheme and as an income transfer scheme. Lastly, the scheme helps the government manage its buffer stock. See, during the pandemic, the amount of grains procured by the central government increased manifold. If not for the PMGKAY, this additional procurement might have gone to waste in the FCA goodons. So this scheme helped transfer the additional food stock from the FCA goodons to the people in need. So these are the major roles played by this scheme according to this editorial. Right now this scheme is being discontinued but the benefits given under the PMGKAY will continue. But now it will be provided under the NFSA umbrella. So the author of this editorial says that this move of central government will help the states monetarily. But how? Let me explain with an example. See, we know that under NFSA, everyone is entitled to 5 kilogram of rice per month at a cost of rupees 3 per kilogram, right? But let us say the Tamil Nadu government decided to provide 5 kilogram of free rice to its citizens under NFSA. So every time someone in Tamil Nadu goes to PDS shop and avail 5 kilogram of rice, the Tamil Nadu government instead of asking 15 rupees from that person will pay 15 rupees from its own pocket. So for example, if Tamil Nadu has 1 crore beneficiaries under NFSA and everyone buys 5 kilogram of rice, the additional subsidy burden for the Tamil Nadu government will be rupees 15 crore per person per month. Since the central government has itself decided to provide food grains up to 5 kg for free till December 2023, the Tamil Nadu government can provide its citizens with free rice up to 5 kg per citizen without having to bear any additional burden. 
So like the editorial says, the move of the central government to extend the benefits provided under the PMGKAY till December 2023 under NFSA will provide relief in monetary terms for state. So these are all some of the important points that you have to note from this editorial article. In this editorial article, we saw in detail about PMGKAY and its benefits. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now this news article says that the Tamil Nadu government has come up with a greenhouse gas inventory compendium for the districts of Koyamthu, Trichy and Trinalveli. Here compendium is just a fancy way of saying collection of data. So basically the Tamil Nadu government has come up with the greenhouse gas inventory data for three districts. The news article also provides various findings from the data. In this context, let us understand the benefits associated with creating an inventory like this. See, before making a good plan, we must first assess our performance, right? Take India, for example, we constituted our National Income Committee in 1949 to assess our performance and after that only in 1950, we constituted our planning commission. So, a good reliable set of data is a prerequisite for making a good plan. This applies to controlling climate change as well. This is why the Tamil Nadu government has decided to come up with the greenhouse gas inventory. The inventory will have data such as total and per capita energy use, total and per capita greenhouse gas emission and sector wise energy consumption. So this is about the greenhouse gas inventory data. Now let us see the need for such data. See firstly the inventory will help us progress. Greenhouse gas inventories will help us track increase and decrease in future emissions. If you are taking a new initiative to control emission, after some days, if the data from the inventory is showing a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, then we know that the initiative is working. So, we will continue with the initiative, right? Like this, the greenhouse gas inventory will help us make informed decisions. Secondly, this GHG inventory data will help us understand local needs. Following a one-size-fits-all type of initiative will not help us address the problem of climate change. So to address climate change, we must understand the local problems and take specific steps to address them. For example, the article says that the maximum amount of emission in Coimbatore came from manufacturing and construction sectors. In case of Trichy and Trinalveli, the maximum greenhouse gas emission came from the residential sector. So, local plans to address emissions from manufacturing and construction sectors must be made for controlling emission in Coimbatore and in case of Trichy and Trinalveli, major focus must be provided to the residential sector to control greenhouse gas emission. Like this, the inventory helps us to make area specific plans to address greenhouse gas emissions. And finally, the greenhouse gas inventory will help us integrate climate change control measures into the ongoing urban development process. India is fast urbanizing. Data suggests that by 2060, more than 50 percentage of Indians will live in urban areas. The majority of the problems that we currently face in major urban centers like Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai and Bangalore are due to unplanned haphazard urbanization. We can learn from our mistake and make the future urbanization process a planned one. We can also make our future urbanization plan climate sensitive but integrating climate change control in the planning stage itself. To make a proper climate sensitive urban development plan, data from the greenhouse gas inventory can be used. This will make our future cities sustainable. So these are all some of the major advantages of greenhouse gas inventory data. So in this news article discussion, I hope you get to know about a new initiative by Tamil Nadu government called greenhouse gas inventory data or greenhouse gas inventory compendium. So whenever you see a new initiative like this, you can make a note of them and write it in your main answer. So these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. This news article reports about an observation regarding retirement age of judges. Few days back we discussed about the issue of pendency of cases, right? One of the suggestions to solve it was to increase the retirement age of judges. After considering this, the Department of Justice has noted that this will not be beneficial, citing many reasons. 
Now, before getting into the reasons, first let me tell you what are the current retirement ages of judges. See, Supreme Court judges retire upon attaining the age of 65 years. It is as per Article 124, Clause 2 of Indian Constitution. On the other hand, for the High Court judges, the retirement age is fixed at 62 years by Article 217, Clause 1 of Indian Constitution. Now let us see the reasons cited by the Justice Department for not considering increasing the judge's retirement age. See the first reason is if this is done then it will benefit non-performing or underperforming judges or inefficient one also. So this will further weaken the judiciary. So this is the first reason. Secondly, it might deprive tribunals of having retired judges as presiding officers. See, many tribunals have the mandate to appoint an incumbent as well as retired judges as chairperson. Take NGT for example, the qualification of NGT's chairperson is an incumbent or retired judge of Supreme Court or Chief Justice of High Court. If the retirement age is increased, then only the incumbents will be considered for the set position. Okay, so this is the second reason. Thirdly, a similar proposal will be put forward by other government employees also. See, employees at central and state levels, PSUs, commissions, etc. may raise similar demands, which will create a problem and will also increase the unemployment rate further. So, based on these reasons, the Justice Department said that as of now, there is no proposal to increase the retirement age of judges. If they want to handle the pendency of cases, they can go for a much better option. It is to fill the vacancies in judiciary. So that is all you have to know about this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we saw about retirement age of judges and why the Department of Justice said that increasing the retirement age of judges will not help judiciary. So these learned points. Now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now this editorial article is addressing a crucial issue regarding an important constitutional office. I am talking about governor only. Yes, again an issue with the functioning and powers of governor has come under scrutiny. It is about the delay by governor in providing assent to bills passed by state legislatures. Now if you are asking me why suddenly this is in news, we will see that in the news article discussion. Also we will see. What is the role of governor regarding a legislation? What the constitution says about that? And we will also try to understand some of the suggestions of different committees in this regard. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference. You can just go through it. So why this issue is a news? The issue is in limelight because of Tamil Nadu, especially its legislation that is meant to regulate online gaming and prohibit online gambling. The name of the legislation is Tamil Nadu Prohibition of Online Gambling and Regulation of Online Games Bill 2022. It was tabled in Tamil Nadu Assembly after an ordinance was passed for the same by Tamil Nadu Governor. The legislation was a much needed one as there were many incidents of suicides and depression among citizens due to online gaming and gambling. So Tamil Nadu legislature passed the bill in October itself. But till today, Governor R. N. Ravi has not provided assent to it. He has not decided on it for past two months. The point to note here is, this is not the only legislation of Tamil Nadu awaiting Governor's assent. According to some sources, as on December 1, the Governor has withheld 21 bills passed by the state legislature. The same is the case with many other states. For example, more than five bills are withheld by governor in Kerala. Similar cases in Telangana and West Bengal also. It was even reported that the Tamil Nadu governor termed the withholding of bills as a courteous way of saying no. Can the governor say no? That is, can he or she reject it? We have to look into the constitution to know that. See, the constitutional provision that deals with the assent of the governor for any bill is article 200. As you know, when the bills are passed by house or houses of legislature, it is presented to governor for her assent. When this happens, the governor has four choices. 
Firstly, one is to give assent. After her assent, the bill becomes an act. Second, she can withhold assent. In this case, the bill ends and does not become an act. What this means is the governor has rejected the bill. So to our question of whether governor can reject a bill or not, the answer is yes, she can reject it. Okay. So if the state legislature wants, it can draft a new bill on the topic with some recommendations of governor. But the point I just mentioned is not mandatory by constitution. Okay. Here note that withholding assent means exercising absolute veto. Thirdly, she can reserve the bill for the consideration of the president. This can happen in three scenarios. Firstly, when the bill passed by the state legislature endangers the position of the state high court or when it is ultra wires, that is, it is against the provisions of the constitution or when it is opposed to the directive principles of state policy, etc. Note that after reserving the bill for president's consideration, governor will not have any further role in the enactment of the bill. Okay, so this is the third choice. The fourth choice is governor can resend the bill to the legislature itself. This is for the reconsideration of the bill and for making any amendment to the bill. Here note that the governor can return the bill only if it is not a money bill. Okay. This power of resending the bill is exercising suspensive veto because if the legislature passes the same bill again with or without any change or amendments, then the governor is mandated to give her assent to the bill. This is as per article 200. Okay. I hope now you understood the choices with governor with respect to a bill. There is a problem with these. The problem is constitution is silent on the time limit under which the governor has to make a choice that is by when assent has to be given or by when she can reason the bill or by when she can reject it or can reserve it for president's consideration there is no time period specified for these this has only created a lot of issues in the states we shall see them one by one firstly because some governors sit on the bill indefinitely, not deciding on a bill means exercising pocket veto. So what is pocket veto? In this veto power, the executive neither ratifies nor rejects nor returns the bill, but simply keeps the bill pending for an indefinite period. The executive does not take any action, either positive or negative action on the bill. The issue is in our country as per constitution the executive who enjoys pocket veto is the president of India. The governor does not hold this power. So governor sitting on bills indefinitely means violating the constitution. Okay. The second problem is because the above scenario happens in states ruled by opposition parties. Take Tamil Nadu again. It is not under the centrally ruling party. And here more than 20 bills are awaiting assent. That means the policies of Tamil Nadu's elected government could not be implemented. This is why the critics are saying that the Tamil Nadu governor is against the popularly elected government of Tamil Nadu. Okay. Here you should remember that governor is an unelected figure, a nominal head, an appointee of the central government who just performs important constitutional functions and thereby there is a need for his or her to be impartial and a person of impeaceable integrity. Along with that, governor has to exercise his or her power as per the aid and advice of the council of ministers with the chief minister as head. But in the case of Tamil Nadu, can we witness these characteristics of governor? No. Tamil Nadu governor has openly contradicted the policy of the elected state government by impeding the legislation through delaying assent indefinitely. The federal structure of the constitution is threatened by it. Due to these reasons, Tamil Nadu government has already submitted a memorandum to president for governor's dismissal. Other states in the situation are even asking the parliament to consider dissolving the office of governor itself. If it happens, it will be a major constitutional reform. But what can actually be done? See, the issues arise because there is no 
stipulated time period for governor to give assent or withhold it or reserve for president's consideration or returning to legislature this is a constitutional gap that requires immediate attention many commissions before have felt the same and have given recommendations regarding the time period for governor's decision let us see them one by one first is the national commission to review the working of the constitution see it was set up in 2000 under the chairmanship of justice m n venkata chalaya the commission prescribed a period of 6 months for governor to take a decision whether to grant assent or to reserve a bill for consideration of the president this commission even submitted a consultation paper titled the institution of governor under the constitution under the chairman justice shri b p jeevan reddy the paper prescribed a time limit of 4 months for the governor to decide whether to grant assent or to reserve it for the consideration of the president mainly it asked to remove the power to withhold assent from governor to quite bold decisions right then the punchi commission which was the second commission on center state relations set up in 2007 it recommended that the governor should take the decision within 6 months that is whether to grant assent or to reserve it for consideration of the president okay based on these commission's observations author of the editorial also suggest a time limit which is the governor to act on the bills within 3 months it is much stricter or severe stand than the commissions i think the way the relationship between governor and state governments is moving a strict mandate is required so that there are checks and balances from both the sides so that is all you have to know about from this news article discussion in this news article discussion we saw in detail about veto powers of governor and some of the committee recommendations with respect to setting a time limit for such veto powers so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this news article it talks about the forest rights act 2006 and how the road blocks in its implementation or acting as a hindrance for the forest dwelling communities to get their ownership rights now this article is the result of authors interaction with the communities in the forest areas of karnataka so if you are thinking about using this as a case study then you can use it see these areas have been declared by unesco as critical for biodiversity in the western ghats and it is very usual that before declaring any forest area as a heritage site the opinion of the local population is sought but when the author approached the communities they had little knowledge on this the author thinks that this is because the communities are not truly empowered to know about their rights under the forest rights act 2006 okay so this is the crux of the news article given here so in this background let us understand briefly about forest rights act of 2006 before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference you can just go through it so let's begin with why such an act is necessary we all know that there has been communities and tribes who have been inhibiting the forest areas for so long and they have traditionally resided in the forest cultivated their own food and have kept themselves away from the mainstream society right so when the britishers left people got their land rights but these forest dwellers were left out they were not given any ownership for the land they were living in because of this there was high possibility that they could be evicted from their place of residence so what the government did in 2006 is they enacted the forest right act or fra it was enacted to recognize the rights of forest dwelling tribal communities and other traditional forest dwellers to forest resources since these communities were dependent on forest for a variety of needs including livelihood and other socio cultural needs it is very important to give them ownership okay so that is why this act was enacted and it gives title rights use rights relief and development rights and forest management rights to these communities that specifies the following rights to the communities you can just go through it 
the communities have the right to hold and live in the forest land under the individual or common occupation for habitation or for self cultivation for livelihood they have right of ownership access to collect use and dispose of minor forest produce and they have rights including community tenures of habitat and habitation likewise they have many forest rights but the devil is in the details see there are few provisions which hinder the proper implementation of the act let us see them one by one firstly there is lack of political will see the tribals in most states do not constitute a significant population so the political parties they do not see them as a potential vote bank because of this reason they do not initiate any welfare programs for them secondly the forest bureaucrats often see this act that is this fra act as a way to regularize encroachment and they rarely use it as a means to provide rights to the communities thirdly the act ensures only individual rights but not community rights of the tribals which is an issue fourthly there are problems with the institutional setup see under this act it is the gram sabha that is empowered to determine the nature and extent of the forest rights also the forest rights can be claimed by a person only if his or her family has lived there for 75 years or for three generations prior to the enactment of the act now the tribes do not have any document to prove that they have been living there if their claim is rejected by the gram sabha apart from this the people are deprived of basic facilities and other government benefits extended under various schemes and programs as they do not possess the records of rights tenancy and crops the act just gives them title rights the government must address this issue in consonance with the rules of the act now finally as per the article some forest officials feel that there should be a closure to this act they feel that this act must come to an end they say that based on the act new claims arises every day and it is very difficult to ensure the authenticity of the claims so they wish the closure to this act so these are all some of the important issues discussed in the news article with respect to the fra you can make note of all these points and use it in your main answer so these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion Now this text and context article talks about the dark patterns on the internet. So what are these dark patterns on the internet? Let us understand that in this news article discussion. Before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. So what are these dark patterns? See a dark pattern is a term introduced by Harry Brignall. He is a London based user interface designer. He defines these patterns as a type of user interface that is crafted to trick users into doing things that are not in their interest and is usually at their expense. That is these dark patterns or design elements that deliberately obscure, mislead or deceive website visitors. thereby these dark patterns lead them to make unintended and probably harmful choices for example bait and switch which means a fraudulent or deceptive sales practice here the purchaser is attracted by advertisement of a low priced item but then is encouraged to purchase a higher priced one this is an example of dark pattern then take disguised ads forced continuity through subscription then hidden cost friend scam then price comparison prevention or some of the other examples of these dark patterns if you can just look at this image you can understand how a dark pattern may be so in simple words these kinds of uh, dark patterns or unethical user interface designs and they deliberately make a person's internet experience harder and even exploits them So by now you would have understood that it is not good for the user. Few days back we saw a news article about deep fake, right? So just like that this dark pattern is also a malicious one, okay? So if you are asking me who is benefited by these dark patterns, the answer to that is big firms or techs. They are getting benefited using these dark patterns. See by using dark patterns, digital platforms downgrade the user experience to their advantage 
For example, take Amazon. It uses multi-step cancelling process in Amazon Prime subscription. This was even fired in the European Union. So Amazon made its cancellation process easier for online customers in European countries. Let me give you an another example. See, we get video ads between reels, right? This is also a dark pattern. By doing so, the Google-owned YouTube nags users to sign up for YouTube Premium so that they can be free from such video ads. So, such unethical dark patterns endangers the internet users experience and then it makes them more vulnerable to financial and data exploitation. Then it takes simple task time consuming and thus it confuses users by introducing online obstacles. So awareness should be created regarding these dark patterns and a government study must be done to control these unethical designs. Only then users can experience more user friendly platforms that will respect their right to choose and privacy. So that is why we chose this news article for discussion. So I hope you got a clear idea about what is this dark pattern. So these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article it talks about discrepancies that has occurred in updating the national register of citizens in Assam as per the article the CAG report submitted to the Assam assembly on December 24 said 215 software utilities were added in a haphazard manner to the core software. See this exercise needs a highly secure software. However, there has been anomalies in the process. So this is the background of the news article given here. Now we'll try to learn what is this NOC. See, the National Register of Citizens or the NRC is a register containing the list of the legal citizens of India. So it basically includes the demographic information about all those individuals who qualify as citizens of India as per the Citizenship Act 1955. See, this register was first prepared after the 1951 census and since then it has not been updated until recently. So far, the database is updated only for Assam. But as per the article, the CAG has noted that this updated NRC has so many discrepancies. Now, this cannot be taken easily because based on this updated NRC only, nearly 19 lakh people are excluded from the NRC database which could even lead to their deportation to Bangladesh. Now you may think why this was done only for Assam. See this is in line with the Assam Accord which was signed in 1985. The people of Assam wanted the illegal migrants who entered Assam after 1971 to be deported back to their home country. So it was in this light the government took up the exercise to identify the illegal migrants by updating the NRC. One of the basic criteria for identification was that the names of the family members of the applicant should be present in the NRC prepared in 1951 or in the electoral rolls up till March 24, 1971. Now the government also has plans to update it nationally. Note that a person can present the following documents as proof of his or her citizenship. The documents may include birth certificate, LIC policy, refugee registration certificate, land and tenancy records, then citizenship certificate, passport, government issued license or certificate, then bank or post office accounts and permanent residential certificate. Even government employment certificate, educational certificate and a court record can be produced as a proof of his or her citizenship. Currently, the Supreme Court is responsible for monitoring the entire process of NRC updating. Also note that the NRC is updated on the basis of the Citizenship Act 1955 and the Citizenship Rules 2003. So here you should also know the difference between NRC and NPR. See the NPR is a list of usual residents of the country. It is compulsory for every usual resident of India to register in the NPR. What does the word resident mean? It includes both Indian citizens and foreign citizens. However, if you see NRC, it contains only the details with respect to the Indian citizens and it does not include any foreigners. Okay, 
so that's all you have to know about this news article discussion in this news article discussion we saw about nrc then we saw about the condition to prove our citizenship and finally we saw the difference between nrc and npr so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this news article this news article says that 14 ancient sites including janardana temple in kerala's vayanad the haveli of aga khan in agra uttar pradesh and gompa complex in ladakh have been declared protected by the archaeological survey of india over the past 3 years so in this discussion let us see few points about janardana temple haveli of aga khan and gompa complex so let's start with janardana temple see the temple is located in varkala tiruvananthapuram the temple is located in a small table top land near the sea the main deity of the temple is lord janardana here janardana swami is another name of lord vishnu see the temple is believed to have been built by the devas the legend goes like this a pandya king was once affected by a ghost he went on a pilgrimage but could not cure himself from the sway of the evil spirit when he came to the present day varkala he saw the remnants of a dilapidated temple by the sea here dilapidated temple is nothing but old and broken temple he prayed to god promising that he would rebuild the temple there next day he had a dream in which he was told to go to the sea and stand near the dilapidated temple nearby he would see a large amount of flowers floating in the sea if he searched there he would get an idol the present janardana idol was recovered from the sea by him he built the temple and laid down the rules for maintenance of the temple so this is about the janardana swami temple of varkala next let us take up the haveli of aga khan it is located on the eastern side of taj mahal haveli here means a mansion or a huge house and who was this aga khan see aga khan was an enoch or a kwaja sara who served mumtaj mahal he held the position of fauzdar of agra till 1652 here fauzdar means commander in charge of law and order he also held the post of trustee ship of taj mahal so this is about haveli of aga khan now finally let us take gompa complex so it is located in ladakh as i said already Gompa actually means a solitary place. The Tibetan Buddhist monasteries of Ladakh are called Gompas. These monasteries are often located in hill tops and they are surrounded by mountains. So including all these three ancient sites in the past 3 years archaeological survey of India has declared 14 ancient sites as protected area. now i chose this news article because there might be a map based question regarding the places mentioned in the news article so these learned points now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion with this the preliminary practice question discussion now look at this first question with reference to the provisions made under the national food security act 2013 consider the following statements statement 1 the family is coming under the category of below poverty level that is bpl only or eligible to receive subsidies food grains see this statement is actually incorrect because the act provides for coverage of up to 75% of the rural population and up to 50% of the urban population for receiving subsidized food grains nfsa covers about 2/3 of the population so this statement is actually incorrect Now look at the second statement the eldest woman in a household of age 18 years or above shall be the head of the household for the purpose of issuance of a ration card actually this statement is correct now look at the statement 3 pregnant women and lactating women are entitled to a take home ration of 1600 calories per day during pregnancy and for 6 months thereafter see this statement is actually incorrect because besides meal to pregnant women and lactating mothers during pregnancy and 6 months after the child birth such women will also be entitled to receive maternity benefit of not less than 
rupees six thousand. So this statement is actually incorrect. Okay. So the correct answer for the question is option B two only. Now moving on. This is a previous uh, prelims question. Four statements are given: carbon monoxide, methane, ozone, and sulfur dioxide. You have to find which release due to burning of crop or biomass residue. Option A one and two only. Option B two, three, and four only. Option C one and four only. And option D one, two, three, and four. See the correct answer for the question is option D one, two, three, and four. Burning of crop residue or biomass emit. Gases like sulfur dioxide (SO2), oxides of nitrogen (NOx), carbon dioxide (CO2), carbon monoxide (CO), black carbon (BC), organic carbon (OC), methane (CH4), volatile organic compounds (VOC), ozone (O3), and uh, aerosols, etc. So all the gases given here are emitted when crop residue is burnt. So the correct answer for the question is option D: one, two, three, and four. Now moving on, this question is about Archaeological Survey of India. Statement one: It was established in 1958 under the Archaeological Sites and Remains Act, that is AMA SR Act 1958. See, this statement is actually incorrect. It was founded way back in 1861 itself by Alexander Cummingham. In 1959, the ASI was accorded statutory status after the enactment of AMA SR Act. Okay. So this statement is incorrect. Now the second statement is actually correct. It is an attached agency of Ministry of Culture. Now the third statement is also correct because along with Archaeological Sites and Remains Act, the ASI also regulates the Antiquities and Art Treasure Act of 1972. Okay. So the correct answer for the question is option C, two one three one D. Now the question displayed here is the quiz question for you today. You can just go through the question. And comment the correct answer in the comment section. The questions displayed here are the mains practice questions for you today. Just go through the questions, try to write an answer, and post it in the comment section. So with this, we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like the video, hit like, do comment, and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Now, thank you for listening.